Hello, 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 YouTube world. It's Miss Patty with For Your CNA, and I'm here to um, produce the only live CNA game show on YouTube where you can win prizes for answering CNA questions. So welcome. I'm so happy everybody is here. So when you come in, just give me a quick hi in the chat. And uh, that kind of locks in your seat, and we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. So come on in, give me a hi in the chat, and while you're doing that, hi Shanice, while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you about today's topic. So good morning, good morning Denise. So today's topic actually comes from um, providing specialized care for residents with changes, so this is a category on the written test that causes a lot of confusion for students. There, you know, a lot of students are like, what kind of questions would they ask us from this category? So specifically, this category breaks down into three subcategories, physical problems, psychological problems, and then uh, care of the dying resident. So a lot of people, when they're trying to get ready for the, the written part of the state exam, they focus on physical impairments. So things like Parkinson's, uh, COPD, congestive heart failure, you know, they, they kind of get really deep into anatomy and physiology, signs and symptoms and all of that. But remember that that um, is only one, cate one um, subcategory under this main category. And a lot of people just aren't very comfortable talking about care of the dying resident. So that's where all of our questions today are going to come from, is the care of the dying resident. Now, this is going to include things like grief processes, responding to emotional needs, um, responses to grief, post-mortem care, and physical changes um, during the dying process. So we've got 15 questions here that we're gonna get into on this particular topic. And it's one that most people aren't very comfortable with. So um, I'm gonna get set up here. Go ahead, guys. Um, make sure that you gave me a hi in the chat so I know that you're here if you're gonna be participating. And today, first place um, winner is going to get the CNA card game as well as the badge holder. Second place will get the badge holder. Third place is going to get an inspirational keychain and a uh, wristband, an inspirational wristband, so that you uh, are reminded every day of just how special you are and how much of a difference you make. So give me one second, guys. I'll be right back, and we're going to get started. Okay, are you guys ready? Are you ready to get started? Let's go over the rules real quick. So each question is going to dis be displayed for about 45 seconds for you to indicate your answer. It's actually 60 seconds overall. It gives me some time to read the question to you. And then you'll have about 45 seconds to lock in your answer. In order to answer, remember this is live, in-person game show. So you guys are going to participate. You're going to type your answer in the chat. You'll either type in numbers, one, two, three, or four, or you can use letters A, B, C, and D, okay? Um, but you're going to type your answer in the chat and make sure that you hit the send button. The quickest answer gets the most points. So if you're the first person to get the right answer, you're going to get 10 points. The next person will get nine, the next person gets eight, and so on. And this is how your points are going to accumulate and you're going to get on that leaderboard. At the end of the 15 questions, the number one place winner will receive the first place prize. The number two place winner will receive the second place prize. And this is first time we're doing a third place prize. So I'm really excited about that. So um, are you ready? Let's go ahead and jump in. Let me get my program up and running. This is just such a cool program to be able to let us do this live. So we want to send a shout out to the program developer. Thank you so much. So this is going to go live 
in about 45 seconds. Go ahead and limber up those fingers, get yourself ready, and we're going to compete for live prizes today. All right. A few more seconds here. Let me get my chat popped out. Yeah, I agree, Denise. This is really cool. And this is a program that not a lot of people know about. So it's really cool that we're able to do this. All right. So guys, next week, well, well, I got 10 seconds left. Next week, I'm going to a conference. I'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. All right, here we go. Ready? First question. Nancy cares deeply for a terminally ill patient who has no interest in religion. Nancy feels the patient will suffer for eternity after death. What should Nancy do? One, explain how the afterlife works. Two, continue to care for the patient in a professional manner. Three, pray out loud for the patient to demonstrate her concern. Or four, have her, her pastor visit the patient. Which one do you guys think Nancy should do? Explain how the afterlife works. Continue to care for the patient in a professional manner. Pray out loud for the patient or have her, patient, her pastor visit the patient. Go ahead and lock in your answers. You've got about 10 seconds left. So put the number in the chat and then hit the send button to lock in your answer. Here we go. The correct answer is correct. Number two, you guys got it right. Great job. Continue to care for the patient in a professional manner. Yeah, our religious beliefs don't have any bearing on our ability to take care of that patient. Um, religion is one of those really tricky uh, things. You don't, your beliefs or your beliefs are deeply held. I have a whole lesson on that you can go watch. But remember that your patient's beliefs are also deeply held by them. So we're not there to um, try to uh, share our religion with them. Our job really is to provide the best compassionate care that we can and not make them uncomfortable in the process. So continuing to care for the patient in a professional manner would be the right answer. Now you guys will have a question similar to this on the state exam because they want to make sure that you can maintain those professional boundaries, especially when we get into tricky subjects like religion. All right, so great job. Let's see how we did. Denise came in first, followed by Jade, Giovanni, and David. Good job. Good job. Okay, we're going to go to question number two. Give that just a minute. I gotta work on this timing. This score screen is just a little too long. Sorry guys, give me a second. All right, question number two. You enter a room and notice the patient crying. She states the doctor just told her her cancer is not responding to treatment and she's dying. She states that she cannot believe it and doesn't feel like she's dying, so the doctor must be wrong. You would, one, tell the patient that the doctor is always right. Two, tell the patient she should get a second opinion. Three, understand that denial is part of the grieving process. Or four, consult the chart to see if the doctor was right. What do you guys think? Tell the patient the doctor is always right. Tell the patient she should get a second opinion. Number three, understand that denial is part of the grieving process. Or number four, consult the chart to see if the doctor was right. Go ahead and lock in your answer. That one was a little long, I know, guys, sorry. <laughs> lock in your answer. And yes, number three, understand that denial is part of the grieving process. We're going to offer to listen yeah, that's, that's really our role here. That question was a little long, sorry. That's really our role here is to understand that grieving process and to offer to listen. So you guys are on a roll. You're, these questions were just a little too easy. They're going to get a little harder as we go, but you guys have got a really good grasp on uh, death and dying so far. So great job, great job. So there are many stages to grieving. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Um, but our role throughout that whole grieving process is just to support the patient, to be that um, caring 
ear to listen and caring hug when they need some support. So as long as we understand our role, um, our patients will feel cared for and cared about. So let's go uh, see our scoreboard. So Denise, NS, Jade, David, and at home are our top five. Good job. Good job. So far, Denise is in the lead with 20 points. Uh, Jade is in second place with 17. And David is in third place with 14, but the game is still young. So uh, you've, got a, you've got a chance here, guys. Question three. A patient has been diagnosed with a terminal illness. This means that, one, the patient will require chemotherapy and radiation to achieve remission. Two, the patient will need to be moved to an isolation room. Three, the patient has completed treatment and is likely to be discharged in the morning. Or four, there is no known cure and the condition will likely result in the patient's death. What do you think a terminal illness means? They need chemo and radiation, they need to be moved to isolation, they've completed treatment, or their condition will likely result in death. So this patient has been diagnosed with a terminal illness. What does that mean to you? Go ahead and lock in your answers. You've got about five seconds left. Five seconds left. All right, so our correct answer is number four. Terminal illness means there is no known cure. So there's nothing left for us to really offer this patient other than comfort care. Um, they've, you know, th th there just isn't anything that we have in our bag of magic tricks that's going to um, take this, this illness away for the patient. So terminally ill means that the patient is likely going to die from this condition. Now in medicine, this is really hard for us to swallow. We, um, we, you know, we want to believe that everything can be fixed and unfortunately it can't. Um, there are conditions and illnesses and injuries that are just too um, advanced for our medical um, system to really do anything about. So let's see how you guys did on this one. Is the sound better for this one? Um, I worked on the sound. I hope it's better. So top five, Denise, David, NS, Jade, and Andy. Good job, guys. Oh, we got lots of people joining in now. Um, very good. Very good. So um, Denise, David, NS, Jade, and Andy took up our top five for that particular answer or question. We're going to move on to question number four. Which of the following is not a stage of grief? One, peace, two, anger, three, bargaining, or four, denial. Which of the following is not a stage of grief? Go ahead and lock in your answers. Oh, you guys are all united here. Good job. Good job. So which of the following is not a stage of grief? Peace, anger, bargaining, or denial? Got about 15 seconds left before the answer is revealed. Let's see how you guys did. This is question number four. Is the audio better? Can you hear me better to this, this session? All right, uh, peace is not a stage of grief. That is correct. You guys all got that right. You are way ahead of me. I'm going to have to make these questions just a little bit harder. Yeah, so our five recognized stages of grief are anger, bargaining, denial. Those are all correct. Um, depression and acceptance. Those are the five stages of grief. Um, and we have to understand that when we're working with patients with terminal illness, and they know 
that you know they, they this condition will be taking their life they're going to be experiencing one or more of these stages of grief and remember that these stages can actually overlap it's not one or the other so they may be angry and in denial and bargaining they could just be all over the place because that's kind of how the grief process works it's really messy really messy let's see how you did so first place was Jade, followed by Ines, Anid, Goddess, and Denise. Good job, guys. Awesome job. So you can see all the way in the right-hand column, you can see um, your total score for the game. So you can kind of see what your total score is and how it ranks against others. We, uh, Jade and, and Denise are pretty close. Question number five. All terminally ill patients experience, one, all stages of grief before they die, two, denial that they are dying, three, grief stages in a specific order, or four, grief differently. What do you guys think? All terminally ill patients experience all stages of grief before they die, do they all experience denial that they're dying? Do they all experience grief stages in a specific order? Or do they all experience grief differently? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Go ahead and lock in your answers. You've got about 10 seconds left. Yeah, this one was a little bit harder, wasn't it? A little bit harder. All right, so our correct answer is number four. Yeah, they all experience grief differently. And not everybody gets through all of the stages of grief before they die. They may get to anger and get stuck there, and they're angry throughout their entire terminal illness. That's a possibility. And I've worked with, I used to be a hospice nurse, I've worked with a lot of patients that got stuck in anger. I've also worked with a lot of patients that got stuck in denial as well, um, depression. So you can have patients that kind of bounce in and out of all of these stages. You can have them that get stuck in one stage and never, never move beyond it. Grief is individual. So it's um, not common for everybody to go through all the stages of grieving and get to acceptance. That's actually not all that common. So everybody grieves differently right then we have to understand that we do have to understand that there's no right way to grieve so let's see how you guys did so first place was david followed by crystal tiana and marie and kimberly good job well we got lots of people on now so you can take a look at where you are in the leaderboard and you can see your total score there in the column to the right in yellow so take a look at where you are. We're really close, really close, guys. All right, question number six. When you enter the room of a 46-year-old terminally ill patient to pick up her lunch tray, she screams and throws a brush, barely missing you, and yells at you for leaving the tray in the room for so long. This patient may be experiencing, one, the acceptance stage of grief, Two, a mood swing due to her developmental stage. Three, the anger stage of grief. Or four, an undiagnosed mental illness. What do you guys think? This is a 46-year-old woman who's terminally ill. You go to pick up her lunch tray and she throws a brush at you and then yells at you for taking too long. What do you think she might be experiencing? The acceptance stage of grief, a mood swing, from her developmental stage, the anger stage of grief, or a mental illness? What do you guys think? Go ahead and lock in your answers. Yes, number three, that is correct. The anger stage of grief. This is very common. Can you imagine going along, living your life perfectly, right? You're, everything is clicking along, everything is fine, and then all of a sudden you find out that you have a terminal illness and there's nothing we can do about it it's going to take your life. Can you imagine how angry that would make you? You still have a ton of things left to do. And it would probably make you very angry. Now that anger is probably gonna come out in very um, different ways, right? So um, being angry at your caregivers is very, very common. We tend to be the um, 
kind of the, the backboards for bouncing that anger off of because we're there and we're representing, you know, medicine. So don't be, um, don't take it personally. This is um, how they're coping with this catastrophic life event. So let's see how you guys did. Denise came in first on that one, uh, followed by Indid, Jade, David, and Alina. Good job, guys. Good job. Very good. All right, so we're going to go on to question number seven. Are you guys starting to see how these questions might be asked on the state exam? Notice that they're mostly scenario questions. So question number seven, which of the following is not a type of advanced directive? One, next of kin. Two, a do not resuscitate or DNR. Three, a durable power of attorney for health care. Or four, a living will. What do you guys think? Which of the following is not a type of advanced directive? One, next of kin. Two, do not resuscitate or DNR. Three, a power of attorney for health care. Or four, a living will. Go ahead and lock in your answers. You've got about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. I'm going to be doing an upcoming episode in about three weeks on advanced directives for CNAs and to really kind of demystify what each one of these actually means and how it affects you and your practice. So your uh, correct answer is number one. Most of you guys got that one right. Good job. Next of kin is not an advanced directive. And um, advanced directives are um, documents that are put in place that let us know what to do with the patient when they can't tell us what to do with them. So things like do not resuscitate orders for terminally ill patients, uh, power of attorney, which designates somebody else to speak for the patient, or a living will, which writes down all of the patient's wishes when they're still of sound mind so that when uh, something catastrophic happens, we know what they would have wanted. So these are all um, important things to consider when we're caring for patients that can't really tell us anything themselves. Next of kin is not an advanced directive. It's just the person that we would go to if none of these advanced directives are in place. So uh, first place on that one was Jade, followed by Denise, Mani Maneska, Anid and Crystal. Good job, guys. Very good job. So you can see where you landed on the leaderboard. Remember, you're competing for prizes today. Competing for prizes. All right, moving on to question number eight. We're halfway there, guys. Uh, a is told a patient has a DNR. Oh, a CNA is told a patient has a DNR but has not seen it herself. During the shift, the patient is found lying in bed, not breathing, and no pulse is felt. What should the CNA do? One, begin CPR on the patient and call a code blue. Two, notify the family in the funeral home. Three, call 911. Or four, notify the nurse immediately. So a CNA is told that a patient has a DNR but has not seen it herself. During the shift, the patient is found lying in bed, not breathing, and no pulse is felt. What should the CNA do? One, begin CPR on the patient and call a cold blue. Two, notify the family and funeral home. Three, call 911. Or four, notify the nurse immediately. Go ahead and lock in your answers. And the correct answer is number four, notify the nurse immediately. Now, I want to show you something in this question because this is some thing that they'll do on the written test to kind of throw you off. Notice it says a CNA is told the patient has a DNR but has not seen it herself. That has no bearing on this question at all. CNAs don't need to see the DNR to be able to um, honor it. So that one statement right there but has not seen it herself that's actually what we call a red herring, something to push you in a different direction to see if you really truly understand your role. So if a patient has a DNR and the patient 
um, expires on our shift, our job is to notify the nurse immediately. We don't begin CPR because they have a DNR. We don't notify the family because that's a nurse's job. We don't call 911 either. We just notify the nurse immediately. So good job, guys. Denise got first place on that one, followed by Crystal, NS, David, and Jade. Good job. Uh, look at those scores. There are some really, really close scores here. So we're going to move on to question number nine. I hope you guys like this game show. I hope you like this format. I'm going to work on shortening the questions a little bit for the next one. All right. In caring for a dying patient, which of the following is appropriate? One, provide privacy for visits with family, friends, medical professionals, and spiritual leaders. Two, restrict visits with family and friends so the patient is not overstimulated. Three, avoid conversations with the dying resident or their family. Or four, open the window so their soul does not get trapped and become a ghost. So do we provide privacy? Do we restrict visits? Do we avoid conversations? Or do we open the window? What do you guys think? I got a funny story about this one. Go ahead and lock in your answer. Go ahead and lock in your answer. Yeah, this is an easy one, isn't it? Easy one. All right, got about 10 seconds left. Go ahead and lock in those answers. And the correct answer is going to be, you guys all got this one right, too easy. Yeah, we're gonna provide privacy for visits. Absolutely. Now, that means there's, there's gonna be a lot of privacy provided here, right? Because we're providing privacy for family and friends, but also for medical professionals and spiritual leaders. So we're really going to have to work hard to maintain this patient's kind of um, bubble of security uh, during that dying process. What you don't want to do is restrict visits. That We actually want to encourage visits. And don't avoid conversations. Remember that a big part of what we do is providing that emotional support. They need to be cared for and cared about. And we don't open the window so their soul doesn't get trapped. That's You will see some CNAs doing that, but that's not really an accepted medical practice. So be careful. That answer is on this quiz for a reason. Never choose that on the state exam. So first place went to Jade, followed by Denise, Monesca, David, and Anne Marie. Good job, guys. Very good job. This one was a little bit easy for you, I know. All right, we're moving on to question 10. Only five more to go. All right, here we go. Question number 10. Which of the following is not a sign of approaching death? One, a rattling or gurgling sound when the patient breathes. Two, warm, dry, pink skin. Three, disorientation or confusion. Or four, a weak pulse that is abnormally slow or fast. Which of the following is not a sign of approaching death? One, a rattling or gurgling sound. Two, warm, dry, pink skin. Three, disorientation or confusion. Or four, a weak pulse that is abnormally slow or fast. What do you guys think is not a sign of approaching death? Man, you guys are good. You're very good. All right, so the right answer here, you got about five seconds left, five seconds. The correct answer is number two, warm, pink, dry skin. That is normal. That is not a sign of approaching death. That's me right now. My, my cheeks are a little bit pink because I'm in Florida and it is humid here, right? So I'm a little bit pink. So warm, dry, pink skin, that is normal. That is not normal for the dying process. Usually the skin gets very pale, clammy, might even have a bluish tinge to it. Rattling and gurgling sounds when the patient breathes, that is a sign of imminent death. Disorientation and confusion is very common when patients are actively dying. In fact, most patients that are actively dying and can still talk We'll talk about getting on a train or a bus. Traveling is very, very common uh, for hallucinations and delusions during the dying process. 
And abnormally slow or fast weak pulses is also a uh, sign of approaching death. So warm, dry pink skin is not. So Denise came in first on that one, followed by Jade, Crystal, Ended, Tiana, and Monesca. Good job. Very good job. All right, moving on, we're going to go to question number 11. So we're almost done here, guys. There's 15 questions total. If you like this presentation, make sure you give me a thumbs up. All right, question number 11. Which of the following is a normal physical event after a patient has died? So which of the following is a normal physical event after the patient has died? One, the eyelids may remain open with a fixed stare. Two, the person's jaw muscles will clench shut. Three, the person may sit up suddenly as the muscles contract. Or four, the patient will immediately become rigid and difficult to move. Which of the following is a normal physical event after a patient has died? One, the eyelids may remain open with a fixed stare. Two, the patient's jaw muscles will clench shut. Three, the person may sit up suddenly. Or four, they will immediately become rigid. Ah, I was able to trick you on this one, guys. The right answer is the eyelids may remain open with a fixed stare. When somebody dies, they do not go immediately um, rigid. They don't clamp their mouth shut. They don't sit up suddenly. Muscles do not contract. None of that happens. And I know that we see that on um, Hollywood, we call it Holly Weird, right? On movies and TV shows. That doesn't happen, guys. It actually takes hours for the lactic acid to leach out of the muscles for them to actually become rigid. That happens hours after death. So there are um, a couple of stages of death. So we, when somebody dies, they are still very, very placid. They actually look like they're sleeping. All of their muscles are relaxed, just like, you know, when somebody's sleeping, right? Everything is nice and relaxed. And then over hours, they will become, yeah, no one answered that one correctly. They will actually become a little bit more rigid, which is called rigor mortis. That lasts for about roughly 24 hours or so. And then those chemicals leach out and the patient becomes very, very um, pliable again. So this is all a chemical shift in and out of the muscles due to gravity, but um, it's not common for them to just sit up all of a sudden. All right, question number 12. What is an appropriate aspect of post-mortem or after-death care for a CNA? One, remove all tubes and drains. Two, place the patient on their side in a fetal position. Three, don't let anyone in the room to see the dead body. Or four, bathe the body gently and dress in a clean gown. So which of the following is an appropriate aspect of post-mortem care for a CNA? One, remove all tubes and drains. Two, place the patient on their side in a fetal position. Three, don't let anyone in the room. Or four, bathe the body gently and dress in a clean gown. Oh, I see lots of different answers for this one. Go ahead and lock in your answer. You got 10 seconds. Go ahead and final answer, guys. The right answer is number four. We're going to bathe the body gently and dress it in a clean gown. Now, some of you guys put one, and I want to address that really quickly. Removing all tubes and drains is actually not an accepted practice for CNAs unless it's been delegated by the nurse. So this is very, very important because in a lot of cases, patients have to go to the ME's office with all tubes and drains intact. This is especially important if it was an unanticipated death. So if you just go in and remove all the tubes and drains and think that, you know, that that's, you know, what you're supposed to do, you actually might be interfering with the, the legal aspect of dealing with that death. As a CNA, our sole responsibility is to bathe the body gently and dress it in a clean gown. We would only do anything else if directed by the nurse. So make sure you understand the difference there. Okay. 
Um, so Jade came in first on that one, followed by David, Ended, Roseland, Monesca, and Life. Good job, guys. Very, very good job. All right, moving on. Question number 13 coming up. Oh, that's okay, Dan. Come on in. <laughs> All right, if you guys like this, give me a thumbs up. That way YouTube knows that you like this comment. Here we go, question number 13. The type of care provided by hospice, which centers around promoting the comfort and dignity of a patient, is called, one, palliative care, two, death watch, three, quiet care, or four, elder care. So the type of care provided by hospice, which centers around promoting the comfort and dignity of the patient, is called, one, palliative care, two, death watch, three, quiet care, or four, elder care. Go ahead and lock in your answers. Got about 20 seconds left. Go ahead and lock in those answers. All right, two questions after this one, guys. We are almost at the end. You are such a good group. I absolutely love doing this. All right, correct answer is palliative care. That is correct. So palliative care means that we don't have anything medically to offer this patient. We're not treating to get them better. Palliative care means that we're trying to maintain the highest possible quality of life and relieve any suffering. So we're managing symptoms, which is what we do in hospice care. We manage symptoms. Um, it's not called death watch. And I know that's how a lot of people refer to it. You know, the, the dying process, it's the death watch. That's actually not a medical term. That's just what a lot of uh, people call it. But to me, that kind of minimizes the emotional significance of what we're doing. Palliative care is a much better description because we're focusing on those symptoms and making the patient as, as comfortable as possible. Quiet care and elder care, those don't enter into end-of-life care at all. So let's see how you did. David came in first, followed by Tiana, Jade, Monesca, and Life. Great job. Oh, we got some really good scores here. Good job. It's, it's a close one. We'll see who comes in first, second, and third and gets those prizes. All right, we're moving on to question number 14. Question number 14. Here we go. You are just about to bathe the patient who has recently died when her daughter asks for a moment alone with the patient. What is an appropriate response? One, I was just about to bathe her. Can you please wait in the hallway until I'm finished? Two, please let me know if you need anything. I'll close the door to give you some privacy. Three, you should have gotten here sooner. I'll let you know when I'm done. Or four, the funeral home is on the way. You can visit her there. What do you guys think? Go ahead and lock in your answers. Number one, I was just about to bathe her. Can you please wait in the hallway till I'm finished? Number two, please let me know if you need anything. I'll close the door and give you privacy. Four, you should have gotten here sooner. I'll let you know when I'm done. Or, or I'm sorry, that's three. Or four, the funeral home is on the way. You can visit her there. Go ahead and lock in your answers. Got about three seconds left. And number two is correct. Please let me know if you need anything. I'll close the door to give you privacy. Our task of cleaning the patient should never, ever, ever interfere with the patient's, uh, with the family's right to say goodbye to the patient. So very, very important, guys, that we have to understand our prioritization here. Our um, our need to bathe the patient it does not come before the patient's family's rights to visit. So keep that in mind, especially with post-mortem care, because that family's going to need that time and privacy to say their, their, their goodbyes and to, to process their own grief reactions. So I know number one was very tempting, and I know some of you guys answered that, but it's actually not the right answer, and it's definitely not the right answer for the state exam. So, all right, let's see how we did here. And first place goes to David. Second place is Denise. 
followed by Crystal, Roseland, Monesca, and Tiana. Good job, guys. One question left. Here it is, the final question for all the cookies. Let's see what we come up with. This is a, a, a pretty good quiz. You guys did really, really well. Um, we have one question left, but you guys did really, really well. You are assigned to perform post-mortem care, which you've never done before. What is an appropriate action? One, ask another CNA to perform the post-mortem care. Two, wait until all your other care has been completed. Three, ask the family if they would like you to perform post-mortem care. Or four, tell the nurse that you have not performed that skill before. What do you guys think? You've never done post-mortem care before, so do you ask another CNA to do it? Do you wait until all your other care is complete? Do you ask the family? Or do you tell the nurse that you're not familiar with that skill? What do you guys think you should do? You got 15 seconds left. Final answer. Go ahead and lock in your answers. And we're going to see who won today's episode. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, and tell the nurse that you have not performed that skill. Sure, postmortem care is like any other skill that we do. If it's not something that we are familiar with, it's our responsibility to let the nurse know, hey, I've never done that before. Can you walk me through it? Can you um, assign somebody to help me? Can I watch somebody do it? You need to be in communication with your nurse so that they understand your comfort level. And especially when it comes to something as personal as postmortem care, everybody has a first time to do everything. So you really do need to relay that onto the nurse so that they can help you make that accommodations. Don't shy away from this though. You really do need to be involved in at least watching somebody else doing postmortem care so you can become comfortable and familiar with it. It's not nearly as scary as people um, think it's going to be. It's really not. All right, so let's see how we did on that question. First place went to Roseland, followed by David, Tiana, Ennis, and Jade. Good job. All right, guys, we're about to see our final scores. We're going to see how you guys uh, ranked. So I'm putting my email address in the chat. You'll want to write that down. It's for your CNA at gmail.com. First, second, and third place needs to let me know what their name is, their screen name, and what place they came in. And we can send your prizes out to you. So, I don't know if you can hear me over that music. <laughs> All right, wow, lots of players today. Okay, so we're going to see who came in first, second, and third. Take a look at where you are on that leaderboard. And we're gonna congratulate. Here we go, you guys ready? We are going to congratulate David for coming in first. You are first place, followed by Jade and Denise. So David, you get a card game and a badge holder. Jade, you're gonna get a badge holder. And Denise is going to get an inspirational keychain and bracelet. So all three of you, I need you to send me through email your actual name so we can send this out to you, your address and your screen name and what place you came in. So, so, oh, thank you, Tanya. Yeah, we do this on the first and third uh, Tuesday of every month. So the first and third Tuesday of every month at 11 a.m. is when we do I'm trying to figure out. Okay, there we go. Okay, hold on a second, guys. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to stop the sound. I don't know how to stop the sound, guys. 
This is new for me. I don't know how to stop the sound. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to deal with the sound. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, so first, second, and third place, go ahead and email me with your name, your address, what place you came in, and uh, your screen name as well. We'll get those. Uh, oh, you can hear me. Good. All right. So um, we'll get that uh, those prizes out to you in the mail tomorrow. So we do the game show on the first and third Tuesday of every month at 11. Eventually, I'm hoping to make this into a weekly uh, thing if we can get enough um, interest in it. If I get if I can get up to 50 people on our game show, then I will uh, look at starting to do it every week because there's enough interest there. So if you want this done a little bit more often, make sure that you're recruiting your friends and family to join in as well, your co-workers, your, uh, the other students in your class. Let your classes know about it as well if you're in class. Um, and we'll start doing this a little bit more often. Now I'm actually, awesome, I'm actually going to be, let me turn that off, okay. I'm actually going to be going to a conference next week. Why is that still going? <laughs> oh, it's driving me nuts. I'm actually going to a conference next week for all long-term care uh, facilities in Florida. So this is the first time I've ever gone to this conference. Wish me lots of luck. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. Um, but if you think about me on Monday and Tuesday of next week, um, you know, send a, a, a good thought out into the atmosphere, and we're going to be talking to uh, employers about how our program can be beneficial to their employees for on for initial training and ongoing training, and in services and fun things like this game show to help improve staff morale. So, um, uh, wish me luck for next week, and then in October, I'm going to a YouTube conference because. You know, my, my YouTube uh, plaque right here, right, because we hit 100,000 subscribers, there's a conference I'm now eligible to go to, and it's full of fun ideas like this, so who knows what I'm going to pick up there, so I'm really excited about that, and, um, you know, make sure that you send me a thumbs up on YouTube or a heart or something to let YouTube know that you enjoyed this, and it lets other people know as well. Um, on Thursday... I'm going to be talking about what it's like to work in a hospital as a CNA and what makes a hospital different from any other setting that uh, you might work at as a CNA. So if you're interested, join us on Thursday at 3 p.m. I'm going to go live again and we'll uh, have that lesson as well. Remember that we are on social media, so find us on all the channels. We're for your CNA and uh, we'd love to see you on those channels. So. Until next time, guys, I'll get those prizes out tomorrow in the mail. Congratulations to all of our winners. We're super proud of you, and you guys did great on this one. Great job. I'm super happy. And um, this was a hard topic, wasn't it? But you guys did great. You're all fantastic. You make my heart happy. All right, guys, I will see you on Thursday at 3. Until next time, happy caregiving. Bye.